Hello and welcome to Inside Welsh Rugby, a new online programme for every Welsh rugby fan. This is our very first pilot show and we'd love to make it a feature of your rugby week, so please do use Twitter afterwards to give us your feedback. The programme is designed to give more exposure to grassroots rugby in Wales and provide open discussion and analysis on the issues surrounding the game. We're looking for more clubs to take part, to provide game roundups, panel members and filming locations, so if you can help out, please get in touch and we'll send over some more details. On a muddy Eugene Cross Park pitch last Saturday, Ebru Vale played host to Cardiff Met in their first game since January the 4th. Some strong early play led to Wes Cunliffe being held up over Met's try line, and a surge from the home pack at the subsequent 5 metre scrum resulted in a penalty try as Cardiff's pack went to ground under pressure, with Ian Smurden adding the extras from in front of the posts. Cardiff Met attempted to play some rugby with ball in hand but was met by a strong Ebu defence who created several turnovers, quickly getting on the front foot and pressurising the opposition line. Some good vision and straight running by the Vale backs created space on the right edge and an intelligent kick forced the visitors to kill the ball. Another 5 metre scrum was awarded, once again with the same result, and another easy conversion for Smurden even in the torrential rain. Ebu Vale showed real endeavour in attack throughout, with plenty of go forward and good shape around the fringes, enabling quick ball. Some neat offloads from scrum half Di Jones, with captain Damien Hudd showing brains and brawn with charging runs and deft offloads. Some good hands by the backs kept this move on the front foot, with Cardiff Met eventually infringing. Smurden adding the three points, bringing the first half to a close with Ebu Vale 17-0 ahead. The second half began with Ebu in a similarly dominant fashion. And from a scrum in their own half, some great interplay between Jones, Smurden and Davis almost resulted in a try in the corner for the left wing. Vale's dominant scrum again punished the young visitors pack, forcing their way over the try line only to be held up but it wasn't to be third time lucky for the students, as Mr Price, the referee, once again headed for the posts as the scrum broke apart, with another simple conversion for Smurden. To their credit, Cardiff Met continued to plug away and string some phases together with ball in hand. Although Ebu's defence held firm with some strong tackling, it was on this occasion a little too keen as the backs were caught offside from a ruck. Jacob Chilcott stepped up to slot the penalty for the students and give them what was to be their only three points of the game. More frustration was to come for Met, as a promising position from a line-out five metres from Ebu's line was cleverly turned over by Hud as he isolated the ball carrier in the driving mall. The home side showed typical enterprise in then running out of their own 22. The back line spreading the ball left, and then right again, before a final pass to Cunliffe was adjudged forward. Di Jones typified Ebu Vale's ease with ball in hand, exploiting a gap around the fringes to make ground, before delivering an accurate pass to Cunliffe on the right wing. And despite the move seeming to break down, Cardiff strayed offside in midfield, allowing Smurden to take a quick tap and go, maintaining the tempo of the move. With the forwards doing the hard graft up front and drawing yet another error from the visiting team. An inevitable fourth try was scored by number eight Cameron Regan, Smurden again adding the extras. Even to the final whistle, Ebu Vale continued to show enterprise in their game. Running from deep, hitting contact hard, supporting ball carriers and looking to put teammates into space. They are now 24 points ahead in the championship and it is not difficult to see why without a weak link in the team from 1 to 23 and the ability to play an attractive brand of rugby even in difficult conditions such as these. And the final score was Ebu Vale 31, Cardiff met 3. 
Let's meet our panel. Ben Jeffries, Corporate Director of Pontypool RFC, Stephen Jones, Sunday Times Rugby Correspondent, and Paul Turner, ex-Wales International, coach of 20 years with five years at Newport Gwent Dragons. Paul, what did you make of the Ebbe Vale game? Oh, some good structure. Um, typical Gwent pack, wasn't it? Um, obviously the conditions weren't, uh, weren't very good on the day, but Eugene Cross Park has always been a good surface, um, so they, it allowed their backs to play as well, but typical sort of three penalty tries against the student pack to uh, very much win the game really, but the structures were good and there were some impressive performances. Stephen, some good, good stuff up front there from Ebu. Um, how does that compare to a similar level in England? Very difficult to say. Um, I think probably about the same. I think Ebu Vale has been a fair time since I've seen them play. I'm very impressed by them. I mean, I've seen worse teams than that in the, in the Premiership. Clearly they're way out ahead in their division. Um, Paul said played good rugby despite the, despite the weather. I think the uh, weather was made for them, but I'm really impressed by them. I, I thought they played rugby, wasn't one dimensional. Um, in terms of the third division in, in, in England, I guess much the same. Possibly there'd be an edge of, I think the England game would be pacier, but um, pretty much the same effective wise. Ben, obviously, uh, Ebu are well out ahead in the division. Does that affect the morale of the players on, on your side at all? Uh, no, I think because this year for Pontypool, it's very much a, a build-in season and uh, just ensuring that we're in a, a solid place for next season where we will be making our own promotion push. But uh, you could only be impressed uh, with Ebu Vale. They've worked hard. I think they've had their fair share of uh, troubles with their attempt to get promoted over the last few seasons. And uh, much like when they visited us earlier in the season, uh, when we took the lead at the late portion of the game, they kept the discipline, uh, you know, structures again, work were very good. And uh, they deserve the success they're having and we can only congratulate them for that. Paul, who, who stood out for you in the game? I thought the halfbacks played, obviously the pack performance, um, the two locks, Hud and, and Sweet were, were very good. And I thought Smurden at 10 was, was pretty good and decisive in everything he did. And obviously kicked his goals, but... Um, you know, you can see why they're top of the league. Uh, I think is it 24 points ahead, and uh, they look very well coached. I think Jason Strange is doing a, a real good job there. Obviously, they're going up next year. W what can the players hope for? Can they really aspire to, to a Welsh cap at, at that level these days? There's certain guys that can come through and, and hopefully represent the Dragons in the near future. Yeah, that's that's a possibility. Steve, do, does Wales need an A team? Is that is that a, a realistic next step for these guys? To totally. W Wales need an A team. England need an A team. It's the great bit of the jigsaw that's not there. It gets on my nerves that um, every country now um, just is, they've got this worship of youth. Under twenties is everything. Under twenties play in a World Cup every year. They play loads and loads of games. They play as Six Nations, and then people complain there's no money left. It's the A team. Where, where it's all falling down because the people who are just on the verge of the, of, of the first team don't get anywhere to go. The people coming up from clubs like Emma Vale have got nowhere to aspire to. It is the biggest disaster in national team preparation culture in England and Wales and, the rest, and indeed the rest of the Six Nations. And the sooner they get it back, the better it'll be for all the teams because I can tell you over the years, the great proving ground was Wales going away in Dublin, England going away in Paris. And that was when you'd see, not some guy who might be an international in four years' time, you'd see the guy who was going to be an international in one week and one month. Ben, clearly a tough weekend for you down in Bonamine, 10 8 loss. What yes. happened? Uh, inclement weather, I think, was the, the biggest uh, factor. Although we have to say that Bonamine kept their discipline very well. Um, but we did struggle. We, we couldn't get going in the game. The, the weather didn't help, but ultimately they got the lead they needed. I think in the first half, um, particularly, uh, we weren't able to uh, capitalise on the, the tailwind uh, that we had. And, and they played to the conditions better than us. And ultimately, that's what got them the win. First of all, it's nice that the championship seems to be getting itself together. It seems to be coherent. I, I, another thing that I don't like is that when teams finish top, you go through this big rigmarole, as London Welsh did in England. You go through this big rigmarole of minimum standards, you've got to have a certain number of ladies lose, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. If you've earned your place at the top of the table, you go up and then you've got to put your facilities in afterwards. You should earn your promotion position, whatever league you're in, especially the championship, on the field of play. And then the Welsh Rugby Union say to you, right, you're up, well done. 
this is what you've got to do within two years, to, otherwise you're going to come d- down again. Paul, there's not a game scheduled in the Championship now for about four or five weeks, maybe some rearranged fixtures. How does that impact on the players? Oh, it's got to, you know, from, I think we've all sort of grown up in, in the Gwent Valleys where, you know, we were talking before that you play Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, and I, I know it's a different era now, but something like 45 to 50 games a season. And it was all about playing week in, week out, and the social side of it in the old amateur days. And, you know, these players are just not playing enough. It's the, fan, it's the fans as well, Gareth. The thing is, you know, th- these days you spend ages trying to find out when your team's playing. Like, am I playing on a Friday night? Is it a Saturday? Is it a Sunday? I mean, there's a game in the Amling Cup coming up, 7 p.m. on a Sunday. Absolutely disgraceful. Now, if you're a fan in the old days, I mean, not going back too far, if you're, we're away this week, fine, then we must be home next week. Then we're away, then we're home. You, you, you could find your team, you could plan it, you could get into the rhythm of, of, of watching it. And actually, if you could just clear it out and maybe play at a time when all the other big stuff is not going on, maybe, maybe you're just about in business. Just, just to, to follow on from that, really, if, if, if uh, the grassroots game in Wales were played between, I don't know, March or February and, and, uh, and August, it would give the professional game a good uh, viewing of that game, and yeah. It's on the Super Fifteen kind of model. Well, you know, you'd, uh, it's certainly marketable. That's that's key, and, that, and that's what we're missing in the game. You know, you're talking about the fans. You're talking about the ability to to uh, market our grassroots game a little bit better in the summer months. We lose sort of that dialogue with our supporters for that month. Uh, you know, it's very hard to keep things fresh and keep it going throughout that time. And um, you, you blend that in with the player situation where, yes, they do lose match fitness. And I think Christmas was an example. They came back uh, and, and Pontypool struggled in their first game back because it took almost a first half to get back in that rhythm of playing again. Um, but I, I just it, I think it's symptomatic of how the club game is, is generally viewed, in my, in my opinion, at the moment. You play when it suits us. Uh, but then when, you, when the Six Nations or any big competition comes along, you stop, let the big boys play, you stop your business running essentially for a month. Uh, back in the 70s and 80s, there was a game every week, you know, or several times a week in some, some occasions, and there was a very tribal atmosphere around Pontypool and the town of Pontypool, and I'm sure other towns which had clubs uh, that were really thriving at that time. It supported the town's development. Uh, whereas now it's very difficult. We play on uh, a Saturday here every fortnight, but then when we have these long breaks, um, the town suffers for it, and that community feeling that we've really worked hard to generate here suffers because it's like every time you stop, you're almost having to reignite that and get everybody engaged again. And just when you're getting back in that routine and rhythm, you stop again, so uh, it's, it's difficult. It, it is true, Steve, that, that um, you know, not that long ago, Gwent Rugby had packed terraces and, and it was the, the big draw for the community. So where have the fans gone? Is it just that the, the product's been diluted or...? Very good question and uh, I've got a, a former head coach of the Dragons here and he and I have argued about this, but uh, to me it went wrong when they, you, you mentioned the word community. It, you, it, a region is not a community. Uh, and when they, when they lost that identification, I think they struggled and they lost something which is very, very dear to Welsh sport, culture, history and sociology and they lost it. When the regions came about, uh, you know, with the exception of the Scarlets and Ospreys to some extent, uh, I think that where there was a sense of abandonment, that we weren't really relevant to the current rugby scene anymore and that, you know, you play in the club uh, game and, and then you take your big breaks and everything, but really you fall into the line of the regions and, and where they're going. But there's not been enough uh, consideration from the outset, quite frankly, I don't think, um, as to where clubs fit into the regional aspect and, and that community development about getting the supporters of, of clubs into that regional mindset has not happened and frankly the fact that we're 10 years into that and it's got nowhere tangibly is, is a great shame. So are you losing fans to the region or are people just I not coming I, to the games at all? I think we're losing supporters, disillusioned supporters generally because the attendances at the regional games speak for themselves generally, they're not achieving uh, well, the Dragons and the Blues aren't achieving the 8,000 uh, targets set by David Moffat, I believe, when they were first formed. So where are they going? Uh, that's the question. And is it too late to bring them back? I think there's a chance that it could be, which is you know, a dangerous statement to make. But I think we're at that type of crisis point at the moment. What's your feelings, Paul? Quite strong points there by Ben. Um, 
what can be done? What's the solution? It's quite strange, really, because of the four regions, I think the Ospreys are the ones that have uh, been the most successful. Um, but saying that, you only have to look at their, their clubs in that region at this moment in time, and they're all down fighting relegation near the bottom of the Premiership. So strange, really. Um, I suppose on the, on the Gwemp clubs, it's just a pity, and you know, even my time with the Dragons, um, we tended to you know give lip service to to the region. I know there's a lot of hard work that's going on, but at the end of the day, you know, it it, it was based around Newport Rugby Club. You know, and that's not, we're not kidding anyone on that. It's just good at this moment in time for me to see a couple of these clubs like Ebbo Vale, Pontypool. Um, and my old club, Newbridge, trying to get back to where they feel they should belong. Clubs, for me, are, are the lifeblood, and they always will be. And it's, like I say, it's deeper than just sport. And it's horrible when you see a couple of clubs in Gwent sort of almost ceasing to exist. I think that's terrible. And that, that shows there is something seriously wrong, and we've lost something, some, something and we've got to work to, to get it back. And that's why I'm glad to see, for instance, Ebba Vale on as we just saw, in the third level, but playing decent rugby, decent quality rugby, not one dimensional. And that suggests there's a kind of revival going on, but got to continue because we're coming from a low base because we've deserted the roots. So Ben, what kind of things can be done to save the club game in Wales? Well, I think uh, one of the big aspects that's never really been addressed uh, or even mentioned so far in terms of saving the club game is that not everybody wants to be a rugby player. I think there's a lot of people who want to be marketing, uh, sports marketing enthusiasts, uh, journalists, uh, the list could go on because at the end of the day, clubs have to continue running when the benefactors who are propping them up at the moment, quite honestly, are long gone and, and our objective is to be self-sustainable. First of all, there's nothing that gets clubs going better than automatic promotion and relegation. It's why the Aviva Premiership is so good. And it's why teams like Northampton are now at the top because they sort, they were relegated, they sort themselves out. It makes you fight, it makes you maximise your resources, automatic promotion relegation. Secondly, let's embrace each other, not argue with each other because the, the, the arguments and the bitterness, I mean, Ponapool and have, a, have been in court with the Welsh Rugby Union, that should never happen. Let's, let's have a bit of, um, uh, you know, let's look after each other a bit more than we do. And, and, you, and you made a good point. The level of marketing and media and promotion in the game from, from it's always been poor in the regions. The regions, there was no marketing blizzard when they started. Surely there are enough resources somewhere to get a central marketing team who do the whole lot, who brand it, who market it, who, who, who work out ways of getting people in there, who run competitions. As you, as you say, social media is, is now massive, like it, on, or, like it or not. There's still loads of space in newspapers. There are TV programs, there are radio programs. Central marketing for a division like this could boost it up overnight. You get some kid in there who's, who's dying to be a top marketing man who wants to join IMG, let him cut his teeth on the championship, it would be fantastic. Let's give it, give it an identity and a branding. A lot of clubs have a blank canvas. Um, we had a very, mu very much had a blank canvas when we started this a year ago, uh, and we've tried to bring it up to the modern times. Um, and th there's plenty of clubs who need it and frankly to be self-sustainable they have to have it going forward. The, the professional game um, should be looked after by a professional body and uh, the grassroots semi-pro amateur game should be looked after by the Welsh Rugby Union. Um, I've long been of the opinion that uh, there should be a different board looking after the professional game in this country. I totally agree with that Gareth, I totally agree. When the region started, for instance, Lethe were in North, had North Wales as part of the region. Now, all these four uh, regions were trying to find their own way in life. Then they started getting slaughtered because they weren't promoting the game throughout their region. They should have just let them be the regional team, let them run the pro side. And the, as Paul says, the WRU should have run the rest. It is, it is really difficult to blame the Dragons, for instance. And they're, they're trying to find their own way in life for not promoting the rugby all up around the valleys because they never had time to do it. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. And, and I think everybody is quite quick to blame the regions for everything. But I think there's a lot of issues between the relationship with the, between the WIU and the regions to begin with. There's a lot of questions being asked as to who's responsible for uh, looking after the, the club game. Um, but at the end of the day, as a marketing exercise, the regions with the way they were formed and the principles they had that they represented the clubs. It was their duty 
whether who was permitted to do it or not, it is their duty to ensure that the club game is well integrated into that process. Uh, and I think it's just symptomatic of how almost slapdash, in my view, that the regions were formed. It wasn't the, the, ho the holistic considerations required to make it a success weren't, um, at least in my view, implemented properly. And I think even now we're, we're all left debating, well, what are the regions? What are their purpose? Where do they stand in the spectrum of Welsh rugby? And then the clubs are asking, on the other hand, uh, well, wh where do we belong? What are we doing here? And nobody knows. And, and the debate is getting you know, quite stale now because nobody has a, a proper solution at the top, it seems. And, and it doesn't seem like it's going to end any time soon. Steve, what's the current state of Welsh rugby and how do we get here? Well, it's disastrous for a start. And people who think it won't affect the Welsh team, I, I, I think, are wrong. It's very difficult to be in the Welsh camp as, as we speak um, down in Hensel and not be taking in all this stuff that's happening. Central contracts and bickering and poor Sam Warburton disgracefully being abused and, and that sort of thing. So I don't think the morale has ever been lower and I don't think that the, the, the bitterness has been between all sides has ever been as bad. And, you know, considering that we're a rugby loving nation, not a very big nation, you wouldn't have thought a small nation like Wales would have been able to have so many factions. But it's, it's just been disastrous. It's gone on so long. It seems to be getting worse, not better. And I think it's, it's just a, the worst uh, situation I can remember in Welsh rugby in terms of the off the field. Or central contracts a good thing? No, I don't think so. Um, I think uh, you know one guy is signed when I don't know what he's going to do, who he's going to play for, and maybe by the end of the week we'll find out a little bit more. Paul, don't you think that at least you know people were hemorrhaging? You know, Lee Halfpenny had gone, someone else has gone, someone else is reputed. At least they kept Sam Warburton, who's, who is an icon, to be fair. At least they kept him. Does it matter how they did it? Well, they've done it now, haven't they? So um, I, th I think, uh, you know, whatever happens this week, I think we've got till Friday and we were maybe an announcement is being made. Um, who knows where he's going to be playing next year, uh, unless some deal has been done with, uh, with, with the Cardiff Blues. But uh, they seem pretty strong, um, PRW at this moment in time. Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, that Scrum 5 show, I thought, was, was just a disaster. Um, you know, it's made the situation even worse, um, reading between the lines, as everybody else did probably. Um, so, who knows, let's, let's see what happens by, by Friday, uh, which I think is a deadline day. Well, I, I think the central contracting issue was something that should have been addressed probably at the beginning of the regions, you either do it or you don't, but now I think that's probably complicated the situation even more, because if there is a breakaway, I think the WIU appear to have made it quite clear that um, they won't engage with, with the region, so where does that leave Sam Warburton? I think it may have potentially been a bit of a premature decision for him to sign that deal. Uh, possibly, um, but it's just complicated it even further at a time where I think we could have done without any more complications because there's a, I think it's left people asking more questions than... Yeah, than well, one of the things is that I think the Welsh Union have got to accept that, that the Rabo Direct Pro 12 is not working. Two Italian teams who actually put in more to participate in it than the total sponsorship by, by a huge factor and not interested in it. The, the, the Friday night games um, uh, make it very difficult for visiting fans. No visiting fans go to, to any of the games. I think that with no sponsor, that is on the verge of collapse. And I think the Welsh Rugby Union said, look, we admit that that's really bad. We will allow the regions to play in a definitive competition with the, possibly the English clubs. I think that could be the start of saying, right, OK, you've made concessions, we'll make concessions as well. Someone has got to give something. And perhaps then the, the regions might say, right, we've got one competition we can, we can get stuck into, therefore we're going to look for concessions elsewhere in the new atmosphere of, of harmony, and then worry about Europe later. But the domestic league is really struggling, and with the best will in the world, the Welsh Rugby Union cannot see there being a big profit or anything coming from the Rabo. Is an Anglo-Welsh league a feasible option and how would that work in terms of relegation promotion uh yes so they uh, and welsh league is feasible i think it's the it's the it's the last option for the english clubs because they would dearly love to keep their premiership i think they want a bread and butter league but i think that they've worked out promotion relegation they've worked out that um uh, welsh teams would you know would be subject to their own relegation so uh, just just like the english teams they've guaranteed the english teams in the championship their promotion place if that they win. So I think that's all done. 
I think that's not the details are not as important as the next step that the Welsh Rugby Union allowing them to play in it or not, and I, and I think they should. Could players leaving to play abroad actually benefit the national team with more players playing at a high level in the same position? I think joining the right club um, up until the weekend, you know, guys uh, like Mike Phillips and, uh, and Jamie Roberts with Racing, you know, I think that defeat, I think I spoke to you, Lots the defeat against the Scarlets the other week, the Racing was just a shambles. Mm -hmm. And uh, yet on the weekend, they beat Toulouse at home, you know, and um, both of those players, a um, little bit risky a week before an international, but they both had fine games. So they're going into an international with a little bit of form behind them now all of a sudden. Guys like Dan Lydiot, probably not enjoying his time there, not getting enough rugby. Um, but they will play you over there, that's for sure. They'll, um, they'll treat you like a piece of meat. And you'll, you know, I think quite a few of them pro probably played about six or seven games before we even started the season. Mm -hmm. So there's some good things in it. I tend to agree that, um, you know, as a kid when I grew up, you always wanted to go and watch, um, you know, some legends playing, which we did at that time, didn't we? It was Gareth or Barry or Phil Bennett. You come into yourself, yourself. <laughs> No, I was a ball boy at the time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we used to watch. That, that was what it was all about, you know, watching your heroes uh, and then trying to emulate them, you know, obviously when, when you grew up and played, played the game. But um, that's been affected, obviously, with, with a lot going to France. So um, let's, let's have a quick chat about David Moffat back in the country. Um, you've had him here at Pontypool. You had a Q&A with the fans. How did that go? Uh, well, from our point of view, in that uh, we've been campaigning as a club uh, for quite a long time uh, to have our voice heard and, and more, most importantly, our supporters' voice be heard. Um, because I think that as part of this whole debate between the WIU and Regions, the clubs have generally been quite ignored and seen much effort to in include us in that debate. So when David Moffat announced that he was coming back, we saw it as an opportunity for our supporters who, who feel aggrieved possibly um, from what happened 10 years ago to have their say, but alternatively those who just wanted to ask general questions of David Moffat. Um, David Moffat expressed an interest in coming down to gauge current fan opinion and merely that's all we did was, fac was facilitate that. Our game was unfortunately cancelled 10 minutes before kickoff, so we probably didn't have the full effect, but it was successful from our point of view. First of all, I would assume that he hasn't got a job at the moment. That's why he's, that's why he's here. Um, I think he's been a bit rabble-rousing. I'm not 100% sure about his motives. Uh, I certainly don't think he's helped the debate because he came three weeks ago and things are now far more entrenched than they were when he came. I tend to disagree. I think he's opened the debate. He's actually posed a few questions at this moment in time when he came over that haven't been posed. It was rude the way they asked him to speak on Scrum 5 the other week and then took the opportunity away from him because he had a few things to say. Um, somebody had to come and open the debate and he's been the man. I, mean, I don't take any particular view on David Moffat, but I think what's been important about him coming here is that he's reignited the debate, whereas initially it was just the yeah, WIU. Well. Yeah, I think the, the WIU versus the regions, and we were never going to get anywhere with it. But uh, I, I think David has, uh, Moffat has come along and, and has really upset the order, so to speak, and it's enabled clubs such as Pontypool to get in the debate because it added a new dimension to it. So whatever happens with David Moffat, I think uh, that was a contribution he made, whether deliberately or consequentially, I don't know. Stephen, Six Nations starts tomorrow. What is your prediction? So who do you think is going to win? Is it France the favourites in the post-Lions year? You, you, you can never back, put any money on France because you lose your house. You never know. They've got a decent side, a very, very good side, but they are still, as far as we know, incoherent. I mean, they are the wooden spoonist. How can France, with everything they got, win the wooden spoon. Apart from that, it's the most open Six Nations for years. I'm very worried about the effect of all the dispute has on Wales. And I think that the danger to Wales is, is Ireland because Ireland have got a certain strength. They've got a certain bitterness about their ridiculous overreaction to the old Driscoll issue. And I think that Wales have to go there and that's going to be tough. Italy first up then, any predictions? Should we be wary? No, I don't think so. I think uh, Wales are well equipped to deal with, with Italy. But uh, I think the Autumn International showed that uh, when Wales has a, has a full strength squad, they can face up to just about anybody. But when you take some of those key players away, um, it, it changes the dynamic a bit. So I think keeping a full strength squad will be key for them to go all the way. But for Italy, no, I think they, they'll see the better of them. I think the pro I think that Wales got this problem up front. There's just so little cover in the, in the 
it, uh, for the props and um, getting Jenkins and Adam Jones are really having their injury problems now. Uh, little niggles, calf, thigh, whatever it may be. And um, I don't think Wales are anything like as good without those two fit and firing. And even if they play, I mean, Gaffney's not playing tomorrow, but even if they, uh, he's back next week, they're both short of rugby. And that, that's really worrying. The guy I would love to see play well is Charteris because in the last World Cup, he was absolutely monumental. I thought he was the best lock in the tournament. And it'd be lovely to think he's come back from, from uh, Perpignan and is on form. He's back fit again, isn't he? And uh, just started playing. Um, so he's pretty fresh. Um, superb engine. Line out probably isn't the best part of Luke's game, believe it or not. But his all round play, his defence, um, and as I say, his engine is, is, is very good. And he carries, you know, he's a, he's a very good player. Thanks for joining us for the show. We hope it's provided you with something new and exciting. Please do get in touch via our Twitter page, whether you're a fan, a club or a sponsor who can help us make this programme a regular feature. We'd love to hear from you. Until next time, goodbye and thanks for watching.